in preparing this case study, uh, my take was to sort of give you an idea of what we do with just one aspect of our distance learning program. And it's probably the largest aspect of the program, and that's our interactive video conferencing. And so, So distance learning, I'm going to kind of skip a few things to try to keep things within the time limit, um, begins in 2001, and that was associated with a large uh, remodel in addition to the museum, where a studio for distance learning was created in 2001, and by the fall of 2002, the program got started with little baby steps with lots of program development and very little program delivery. And, um, early programs were all broadcast from a studio uh, on hardwired equipment using a PowerPoint. So while newer technology allows for I do this, there we go, I can see that way. While newer technology allows for, uh, such as the use of a green screen or with uh, dual streaming, you can see the teacher as well as seeing uh, what your teach the work of art older technology it was either one or the other and so that's the way programs were presented in the early years um, in 2005 the Amon Carter Museum became associated with a uh, an entity known as connect to Texas and probably some of you are familiar with connect to Texas they are associated with the Texas Education Agency with our regional education service center um, they call those things different under different names in different states, but uh, they created that. We were one of four cultural, historic, or art institutions that were, we were uh, provided with equipment. Schools were provided with equipment through uh, uh, Department of Agriculture grants, and um, we then got this portable, but in the early years, it still wasn't used out in the gallery space. It was used more uh, in, the, in the studio space. The earliest, oh, I wanted to show this website. They do marketing, they do uh, technical assistance, connectivity assistance, and it's for, a f we pay them a fee in order to do that. We were one of four initially, now we're one of 25 institutions that are associated with Connect to Texas. And then we're also affiliated with uh, CILC, which for without a fee, uh, for no fee, they also provide wonderful marketing for us, and it's a, a great way for um, school districts across the country to search content, video conference content, and um, actually I do as much programming now outside the state of Texas as I do within the state of Texas. So by 2010, and I'm sorry to be showing you all these pictures of me, I do have some videos of video conferencing to, to get to at the end, but by 2005, uh, the museum in the early years had reached less than 1,000 students during any one school year by video conferencing. By 2006, 2007, we were reaching about 3,500, and then by the 2010-11 school year, we reached 15,000 students, which may seem small, but our our actual museum space, and some of you have visited there recently with NAEA, is relatively small. So we were at capacity seeing 20,000, now we're seeing about 25,000 students on site. That's about all we can, we have the uh, space for during the school year. We have school tours every single day. So video conferencing allowed us to um, uh, have a much greater reach. In 2009, we gradually began to take our programming, which had originally in the gallery space, been during non-public hours and, um, what am I trying to say? During non-public hours or in the very early years before my time, they used to close off a gallery space when the program would occur. So the, the visitors couldn't even be in the area. But now the video conferencing program is much more integrated into just the daily life of the museum. So. You can see in this image, I'm, I have the camera focused on a particular sculpture, and you can see all the people in the background. And we've uh, yet to have any complaints in terms of it being an interference to our other visitors who are in the museum at the same time. Although, 
we probably don't have the crowds that Crystal Bridges has in their gallery spaces during, during public hours. But I am in the museum oftentimes with many other school children. We have monthly meetings where we sort of divide up <laughs> the art, who gets what uh, for what programs and so forth. And you can see with the camera, and um, I, I'm sorry that the, the you know, make, enhancing or making it this large uh, for the screen here doesn't really show you the quality of the video that schools are receiving. They can see very small details in the work of art very well, zooming in with the camera. Um, I show this uh, particular slide just demonstrating that even when it's necessary to do a portion of, our pro of a program in our studio space, because it's, it's activity-based, we try to get into the galleries for at least a portion of the program. So here I'm starting a program in the galleries, we're talking about snow. It's a, a math and science-based program. And we're looking, and you can see on the screen there on the right, what the students are seeing is a very small detail of this Charles Russell painting um, and that they can see very well and read and um, uh, talking about um, the blizzard that we're seeing here. And then the a really cool thing about using this technology is that I can bring in other works from our collection that don't happen to be on exhibition at the time that I'm doing the program. So we're looking at a Charles Terzak print and we're looking at one of the original photographs of the snowflake. And those aren't on the wall all the time. So uh, the cart that I use, and you could see in the picture, has, um, has a, a laptop so that I can show other works of art that compare to what we're looking at on the wall, kind of back and forth. And then finally, going into the gallery space to complete the, the program with an activity of cutting snowflakes. And it is possible to teach first graders to cut a six-point snowflake at a, a thousand mile distance from where you are using a document camera. And we've tried a number of things with the technology. We've occasionally had students on site while we're also broadcasting at a distance. And that um, is something that you have to take special care with because if you're broadcasting at a distance, you really have to focus on the camera and the students at a distance and not necessarily the students that are there. So it's sort of a two-part a two thing. We've also had sometimes students presenting content. One of the things that we really strive for is using this technology to not only engage the uh, students, or teachers, by the way, we do professional development using our equipment as well, not only engage them with the museum, but engage them with each other. So um, a goal is to use that one hour of video conferencing time to sort of set something up for uh, some follow-up collaboration, either with, does either th that includes the museum or doesn't include the museum. We also sometimes um, use video clips and um, we prepared those for programs. And something that we're going to be doing this next year, I heard the word flipped classroom mentioned, and we're going to um, have some uh, videos made that are um, videos that are used, would be used in, in conjunction with an interactive program. So that the, the 10 or 15 minutes that I might use during a video conference to do most of the teacher talk is going to be done in advance of the program. So that will even give students more time for interaction during the program. For example, if I'm, I'm doing a narrative writing program and there are certain aspects of narrative writing that we're going to work on, then I'll introduce those in a video that will be downloaded in advance. And then I won't have to necessarily do that from the beginning in the, in the program. There'll be more time to actually practice the skill. We also have other professionals within the museum getting involved. This is, we can take this portable equipment into the uh, conservation lab. That's what you see going on there. And sometimes authors or artists. And this looks like a really old um, photograph because of the Joel uh, Sternfeld's hair, but it actually is only a couple of years old. And he, that's his photograph behind him. He's presenting from the gallery space. Or an outdoor broadcast, which we've done one of. And I show this slide last because, or not last, but <clears throat> um, because I really, you know, I've shown the slides of all the, all the, the teacher talk, but it's really um, about the students. 
And I introduced that in just having a little conversation about, let me check my time here, about challenges in using this technology and the benefits. Um, and those of you that do it, it present interactive video conferencing or streaming or whatever, you know some of these already, but you know that for whatever reason, sometimes students aren't prepared for what they're about to receive. You don't know your audience before, or your classroom before you begin teaching. Um, <clears throat> The technology doesn't behave all the, uh, right all the time. And I have two video clips to show you, and I actually chose one where the technology didn't behave. I did that on purpose. Um, but what I think is needed in this type of teaching more than anything is the ability of the teacher to think on his or her feet. And one of the most important things is, and, and by the way, I'm a long-term uh, classroom teacher before coming to work at the museum. Um, the ability to evaluate a group of students very quickly, which is hard to do at a distance, but by asking a few questions, by looking the situation over and understanding the audience and adapting the instruction, that's, I think, the key to making it successful and making it engaging to students. And always have a backup plan because things don't always work. Um, and expect, expect the unexpected. The benefits, though, in this type of programming is that we reach those who cannot or may not visit the museum. I do think, and this is only anecdotal evidence, but I do think interactive video conferencing has, um, does not prevent students from visiting. It's like Will said, the teachers who, um, who participate in a distance learning program are then more likely to bring their students I think that we're seeing follow-up with students coming into the museum with their families and feeling like it's a place where they belong and a place that they understand. Uh, so I think it actually uh, increases the likelihood of, st of students visiting. It's cost-effective for schools. Um, and it's, a, it's an excellent vehicle for modeling and then building um, critical thinking skills with students. Um, helping students to, to learn how to learn, to learn how to think, think at higher levels, and enjoy the art as they're doing that. And one more slide. Nope, I went the wrong direction. This is our new equipment that a grant um, um, allowed us to purchase for this last school year. And you can see the equipment there a little bit better. Two monitors, a table with a laptop. It's on rollers. There's a very heavy battery at the bottom. Um, I don't know what this weighs, but I'm going to guess it weighs about 50 pounds. And um, we actually usually do the program with just one teacher doing the teaching and working the camera at the same time. It's not always pretty or perfect. Uh, and you're going to see, if we have time for video clips, that we can go ahead and uh, uh, turn on. We'll, we'll look at that. Here's one with, do I have to start this? As horses are running, Frederick Remington loved to show the action. <laughs> of horses running. Let me show you another one of his horse bars. I'm going to ask for Ponder. first 
lesson. Let me get out of the way and let you share, let you see it up close. Who's having the lesson? The cowboys or the horse? Hey, hey, Jason. The horse. The horse. You're exactly right. Ponder, what do you notice about the horse that tells you that it might be his first day of school? What do you think, Wes? Let's go. Worried face on him. You're exactly right. He has a worried face on him. His eye, let me get really close. His eye is just wild there. And I don't know if you realize this, but occasionally a horse will bite. We'll stop this one and off. This is a, now this is a high school class. I'm working with one of our And we're losing our battery power during this one. <laughs> They're doing and how how Frederick Remington is framing them. These are men of action. They are racing across the desert. They're involved in uh, a, a violent conflict here. Do we need to go somewhere else? Yeah. Okay. I think that let's just go ahead and switch back to this. So what I did because we were losing battery power is I always have the entire lesson and the works that we'll use. So if I have to stay in this place because I have to plug in for a moment, then I, I'm showing them this work of art using the PowerPoint. So that's that's one of the things I do is kind of to make this roll around thing work. Because, and I also can't always get in front of what I need to see, so I've got to have a Let's just go ahead and switch back to this. Okay. And y'all do the seats for just a minute. We'll look at the original for a moment. Okay. This is another Remington. So contrast the cowboy that you see in the first painting we looked at while we transitioned, and then this work of art. And again, you're, you're in the gallery seeing the original work. Um, tell me how those sets of cowboys are different. The other reason I wanted to show this one is because what I'd really like to see uh, in our future is using other technologies along with the video conference. I said that with my two breaths. So that where she's saying, let me see a show of hands, we might have kids with devices in their hands. Um, this technology is no longer novel to students. It's been around almost 20 years, 20 years, long time. And um, I, I think that we're going to have to uh, do things a little bit differently using this technology in order to continue to attract um, um, schools to buying into using this as well. Um, in the last couple of years, in just being completely transparent, our numbers have actually decreased a bit in the video conferencing that we're providing. 
Uh, it may be because it's not as, as much of a focus as it was, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of like marketing, Julia can probably say that your numbers of content providers continue to increase, saturating the market. Um, we do a lot of free programming, so I know it's not, it's not a matter of money um, and, and have scholarships and so forth. So because of that, I think that an important part of this conference is to sort of think about how to pair technologies, this one and other things, and, and, and many of the things that Will mentioned, I'm excited to learn more about. And that will conclude my presentation. Mm -hmm.